Hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about reading prostate MRI scans for the non-radiologists. So this is going to be aimed at the urologists, the radiation oncologists, and maybe some junior residents in radiology. Here are my conflicts of interest. Over the next few minutes, there are a number of benefits I hope you will realize. One is the benefit of the prostate MRI examination. What are the essential components? You will recognize what is normal anatomy versus what is cancer and benign pathology. You will learn about the PIRAD scoring system, but specifically you will learn what the diagnostic yields are for clinically significant disease, including some of the causes of false positive examinations. So let's start off with the benefits of the prostate MRI pathway. The biggest benefit relates to its negative predictive value. In other words, its rule out ability. And this is to reduce the number of patients undergoing a biopsy and it reduces the diagnosis of indolent cancers. And, and this is the main benefit. Urologists are also interested in a greater precision of risk stratification, but this depends on the biopsy technique. Urologists are also interested in increasing the detection of clinically significant disease. Here the benefit appears to be mostly in patients who have had a prior negative biopsy. And this speaks to the rule in ability of MRI. So when we do a prostate MRI examinations, there are three components. The T2 sequence, the diffusion sequence, and the dynamic contrast enhancement. Remember, we're only looking at the prostate gland. And a normal prostate will look like this at 1.5 and at 3 Tesla. So what's the difference between a 1.5 on your left and a 3T on the right? Well, it's all about resolution. Let's take the lower two images and magnify those just to get an idea about resolution. So let's look at the glandular structures in the left transition zone over here and this BPH nodule here and this BPH nodule here. This is 1.5, this is 3T on the same patient. And you can see the resolution is quite different. So when you look at a prostate gland, what's the normal anatomy that is being displayed? We have the peripheral zone, which is high signal intensity here, and looks like a cup within which sits the transition zone. So this is the cup here, and the cup here, high signal intensity, and this is the transition zone here, here, and here, and the transition zone sits forward. At the back, we have the central zones with the ejaculatory ducts. So these are, this is the central zone, and you'll see how it inverts and reaches a sharp point towards the Verimontanum. This is also the central zone as it sits behind and above the transition zone, with remember the seminal vesicles and the ejaculatory ducts behind. And these are the ejaculatory ducts here in the center, and then the seminal vesicles, which are these structures here. So that's the normal anatomy and that is stylized on your right-hand side. So the green is the central zone, and you can see how it goes quarterly, which is a point, and just like here. And this is the peripheral zone here. This is the anterior fibromuscular stroma, which is here anteriorly, and it tends to be thicker at the top than towards the apex of the gland. These anatomical structures are best seen on the uh, T2 sequence. And on the other images of the multiparametric MRI, you may not be able to see all these tissues. So, for example, you certainly can tell the difference between the peripheral zone, the central zone, and the transition zone on an ADC map, but you don't see the same differentiation here on the high B-value images. So let's take a look at this man interactively. You can see he's a 58-year-old man with a family history of prostate cancer. He carries a BRCA1 mutation. He has a Gleason 3 plus 3 cancer just behind the anterior fibromuscular stroma, and he is currently on active surveillance. And here he is. 
On the top left, we see the axial, coronal, and the sagittal images. This is the ADC map. This is a fusion image of the ADC map with a T2 image. Here is the ultra high B value image. So let's start off with the axial T2s. Going up right to the very top, we can start here. Here we see the ejaculatory ducts as they come down, the seminal vesicles, ureters, bladder, seminal vesicles, ejaculatory ducts medially, and here is the upper urethra. As we come down, we see the transition zone appearing. This is the central zone, the peripheral zone beginning to emerge, hyper intense. Some BPH is present. We can just see the Veramontanum. Here is the end of the central zone. That's the peripheral zone. Here we see the periprostatic veins. And this is the primary tumor. Quite difficult to see. As we go more quarterly, there's the Veramontanum taking on that V shape. Transition zone, peripheral zone. Going quarterly, here are the periprostatic veins, and then as we go towards the apex of the gland, we see we go past the transition zone. Here is the peripheral zone, that is the anal canal, and then we're into the prostatic and then the bulbar urethra before we go into the penile urethra here, and these are the corpora. And then let's look at it in the coronal plane. Let's go forwards. This is the pubic symphysis. The bladder on the top. And here is the transition zone. The peripheral zone. These are the nodules of BPH. So this is an ectopic nodule of BPH. This is an intraprostatic nodule of BPH. Some of you may have seen this. This is an enchondroma, peripheral zone, transition zone, and we should be able to see the central zone here, and that should point cordially as a V-shape towards the Verimontanum. Here is the peripheral zone. Here are the ejaculatory ducts, here and here medially. Then we'll see the seminal vesicles more peripherally. And as we go back, we see the levator sling appearing, the ischio anal space here, the pararectal space there, and all the way to the back. And that's the external anal canal sphincter complex. Next, let us look at the sagittal plane going to the side. Here is the peripheral zone, the round transition zone, central zone above with the seminal vesicles behind here are those two nodules of bph that we saw previously we're now in the midline seminal vesicles going off to the other side again central zone pointing downwards and the cup shaped peripheral zone and then coming back to the center of the gland that's the tumor in question, and we can see how the urethra goes downwards, backwards, makes a corner, comes out, goes through the external urinary sphincter at this site before going into through the membranous urethra, then into the bulbar urethra, and then into the penile urethra here. And these are the corpora. Okay. Now that we've looked at the normal anatomy, what should cancer look like? I've already told you this patient has a cancer. And this is this anterior fibromuscular stromal tumor here. And we can see on the high B value image, it is hyper intense. And on an ADC map, it has a lower signal intensity than the normal transition zone. So you've now already got two signs of a cancer. A cancer should be hyper intense, on a high B-value image, it should be low on an ADC map, and it'll cause some architectural distortion, although the architectural distortion can be difficult to see. The key sequence clearly is the diffusion weighted sequence, which has two components, an ultra high B-value image and an ADC map. 
So what are the characteristics of a cancer? A cancer shows invasive properties, is hypercellular and hypervascular. So invasiveness on a T2 sequence is shown by something that destroys the normal architecture. And you can see that here on the T2 sequence where the normal transition zone the texture is destroyed and we can see invasion through the false capsule. Hypercellularity is depicted by a high signal on a high B-value image and a low ADC. And hypervascularity is displayed by the early blush of contrast enhancement. What are we looking at when we look at diffusion sequences? We're looking at the water motion in the extracellular space, predominantly with a component that is also intracellular. So if you have a tissue that is highly cellular, the extracellular space will be less, and the water within the extracellular space will move less. And this is this green line. In other words, the water will be hindered. And the tighter the cellularity, the greater is the hindrance, the lower is the ADC value. But you also have to remember that we're also looking at intracellular water. And intracellular water is also impeded because of charges within the intracellular space related to the charges of the membrane and the charges of the proteins which have negative charges. So relating this to the Greece and grey groups, we know that grey group 1 has well-formed glands and therefore the water will move more and as tumours become more aggressive they become more cellular so the water diffusion becomes less because the extracellular space is decreasing. So we would expect a decrease in the ADC value with higher grey groups and you can see this in a number of different studies where the higher the Gleason score, the lower is the ADC value. So let's start off by looking at a couple of cancers which are large, then we'll look at a couple of small cancers, we'll cover some false positive cases. So let's start with this 57 year old man who has a raised PSA, a positive family history, and a biopsy proven 3 plus 4 cancer anteriorly behind the fibromuscular stroma. So if we start with the axial T2 images, we can see this invasive malignancy behind the anterior fibromuscular stroma, erasing the normal architecture of the anterior transition zone. Other lesions are difficult to see, but there seems to be a lesion here in the left peripheral zone, in the region of the left neurovascular bundle. Let's have a look at the ultra-high B-value image. We can see that the ultra-high B-value image is hyper-intense at the site of the larger lesion with a low ADC value. There we go. Low ADC value. What about the other lesion? Yes. So in the region of the left prostatic apex, again, we've got a low signal intensity lesion. We need to confirm that that is hypercellular by looking at the high B-value image. And if we go down there, we can see there's a focal area of hyperintensity on the high B value image. And that's all we really need. So we've got two carcinomas, a Pyrex 5 lesion because it's more than 1.5 centimeter anteriorly behind the fibromuscular stroma, and a Pyrex 4 lesion here at the left prostatic apex. The next thing we need to do is to look at the segmentations. And you can see the apical lesion is about point eight cc's. The anterior fibromuscular stromal lesion is about 4.4 cc's. The total glandular volume is about 38 cc's. And of course we can output these contours for biopsy purposes by exporting the images as a DICOM RT object. Let's look at this patient next. This is a 68 year old man with a raised PSA. He has a lesion here in the left peripheral zone medially, which was shown on a targeted biopsy to be a 3 plus 4 cancer. So if we look on the axial image, we can see the lesion here in the medial aspect of the left peripheral zone. There's a scar here. There's a little bit of retraction of the prosthetic capsule. If we look at the ultra high B value, you can see that there is a focal area of hyperintensity in this area 
with a low ADC. So this looks like a pyrides 4 lesion, but I'd like to see that on dynamic contrast enhancement. And there's the dynamic contrast enhancement showing early intense focal enhancement. So that's clearly a pyrides 4 lesion. We also need to look at the transition zone. And if we look in the transition zone here, you can see a nodule with a glandular structures around it. Now let's look at that in another plane. So, oh, such a large nodule of uh, BPH and a median lobe. And there is the stromal nodule here with glands around it. So that looks like a stromal nodule. What about in the coronal plane? In the coronal plane, again, there's the stromal nodule with glands around it and this very large median lobe sticking into the bladder. So let me illustrate other types of stromal nodules. If you look at this patient, you can see that there is a stromal nodule in the right hand side here with these glandular structures and you'll notice that it's not completely well defined but we're not worried. We're not worried because it is not hyper intense on the high B value image but it is low on an ADC. So if you have an ill defined nodule such as this one but it isn't hyper intense on the high B value image then you don't need to worry about a nodule like this. So how about this nodule here? You can see it's well defined anteriorly and laterally and on its inferior aspect, but superiorly it seems less well defined. So this is an atypical stromal nodule. It is hyper intense on the high B value image and has a low ADC value. So this is an atypical stromal nodule because it's not well defined and it's hyper intense with low ADC value, so its suspicion is higher. So it is elevated from a T2 score of 2 to a pyrad score of 3. But you'll notice that in the right profile zone there is another indeterminate lesion. What is that lesion? And how do you deal with that lesion? Well, there's a number of strategies you can use. One, you can give it contrast, and you can see there's focal contrast enhancement. Number two, you can get an ultra high B value image such as the B1600 and you can see that there is a focal area there of hyper intensity with a low ADC value. In other words, this is hypercellular. So these factors will increase the suspicion of the peripheral zone lesions. So we now come to the discussion of how the PIRAD system says you should deal with peripheral and transition zone lesions that are indeterminate. In the purple zone, you're trying to gauge the likelihood of clinically significant disease on the basis of the diffusion weighted sequence. But if you're not sure, you use dynamic contrast enhancement. That is to say, the arbiter is DCE. And if you have an indeterminate lesion and there is positive focal enhancement, then that becomes a final pyrides category of four. If you have an indeterminate lesion, such as that atypical stromal nodule that you've just seen, then you look at the diffusion rated sequence and the diffusion rated sequence would increase the likelihood of clinically significant cancer depending on whether you saw hypercellularity or not. In fact, there's a number of strategies that you can use for indeterminate lesions apart from giving gadolinium and making sure there's an ultra high B value image and adopting the PIRAD system. You could use PSA density or some other molecular markers. You could decide to biopsy them all, or you could safety net these people and just follow them over time. And that's what we did with this particular patient. So over five years, you can see that that central stromal nodule in the transition zone does not change. But you'll see that the right peripheral zone lesion does change. And when the patient underwent a template biopsy in 2019, we found an increasing volume of tumor coinciding with a rising PSA level. So this brings me to the likelihood of cancer according to the PIRAD system. 
the Pirates assessment categories are from 1 to 5, where category 1 is clinically significant cancer highly unlikely, and category 5 is clinically significant cancers highly likely. So if you have a Pirates category 1 and 2, a negative MRI scan, the chance of you having a clinically significant cancer is very small, 6%. The chance of you having a Gleason grade group 3 and above is 0.05%, so very low indeed. And as you can see on the right-hand side, the higher the suspicion category, the greater is the chance of clinically significant cancer for the definition of Gleason grade group 2 and above and Gleason grade group 3 and above. Now, of course, that means there must be false positives. So, for example, we know that about 70% of men with a Pyrads 5 category have clinically significant cancers. So the others don't have clinically significant disease. In other words, they may have some other pathology or they have a Gleason grade group 1. And when we look at targeted biopsies of, of these positive cases, Pyrads 3, 4 and 5, we can see that no cancer and no pathology was found in about half the patients. That's in on the bottom row. And when you do find pathology, what is the most common pathology that is non-cancerous? And it turns out the most common cause is prostatitis. So let's discuss somebody who has a false positive. This is a 62-year-old man who has had a urinary tract infection but has persistent symptoms and an elevated PSA. He has an abnormal DRE and we biopsied this lesion in the left peripheral zone and this was shown to be a granulomatous prostatitis. And here he is. If we look at the T2 sequence, we can see a, a mass in the left peripheral zone at the apex of the gland involving both the transition zone as well as the adjacent peripheral zone. Looks like a cancer. If we look at the high B-value image, we can see it's hyperintense and it certainly has a low ADC value. So this would do for a Pyrads 5 patient. If we look at the contrast enhancement, we can see that there is an area of enhancement but it's only by windowing quite tightly that we notice that this is in fact an abscess cavity. You see the non-enhancement in the center of this lesion. So this is a typical abscess. Next, let's look at a cause of a false positive caused by an artifact. So this is a 77-year-old man who's got a rapidly rising PSA over a few years, currently 38.7 nanograms per ml, so suspicion is high. And here he is. Let's look at the axial images to start with. Let's go to the apex. Here is a stromal nodule that we've seen before. Otherwise, the transition zone looks fine. No anterior fibromuscular stromal disease. Nothing here in the peripheral zone at the base. Normal appearing seminal vesicles. Let's look in the sagittal plane. Again, we see the stromal nodule looking very typical. Mark BPH is present, no tumour within the transition zone and the peripheral zone also looks normal. Let's look at the DWI sequence and in the DWI sequence we see this. What is that abnormality? That abnormality has a low ADC value here and in fact represents air folding in from the rectum from above. If we go below, we can see another artifact arising from the rectal gas behind the prostate gland. So artifacts are a common cause of spurious results. And remember that gas from artifact can be above or below the area in question. It doesn't always have to come in from the back. So lastly, I'd like to talk about a Pyrides compliant MRI report starts with the clinical details, whether the imaging was Pyrex compliant, and a statement about image quality. 
Then we go into the prosthetic size, we calculate the PSA density, we talk about hemorrhage, and then specifically mention the transition zone, the peripheral zone, the seminal vesicles, pelvic lymph nodes, and bone involvement, and any other findings. In the final comment, we will talk about the location and the classification of any index prostatic lesion, give it a PIRAT score, and because we work in the UK, we would also give it a like score, and we would also give a putative TNM stage. Here are my final messages. The PIRAT systems is a rules-based, imaging-only prostate cancer detection system for multi-parametric MRI. The suspicion categories strongly indicate the likelihood of clinically significant cancer, so it has diagnostic as well as prognostic value. Remember that the MRI identified lesion is the index lesion for biopsy, but it also represents the dominant intraprostatic lesion for boost radiotherapy. The PIRADS categories also integrate objectively with clinical data and other biomarker data when deciding who needs a biopsy. I hope you found these uh, remarks uh, useful for your clinical practice. Thank you very much for listening.